Right. With respect to those who have arrived on time, I'm going to start now, but uh, bearing in mind we are expecting quite a few more still to join us. Uh, welcome to the Governor, Lesetja Kahanyahu. I think I've got almost right. I think I've got a couple of uh, consonants in there more than I needed. Um, welcome to our session today. I'm Sharon Constance and I'm Chairman of the South African Chamber of Commerce here in the UK. And we have the absolute second time honor of having the Governor of the South African Reserve Bank come talk to us today. Today is actually quite a pertinent day that he chose to share with us because it was the Monetary Policy Committee meeting yesterday where they unanimously decided to hold the interest rate steady for another quarter with expectations potentially of things changing in quarter two or quarter four going ahead. That obviously impacts the RAND, which is my day job as well. So being very interested in what the governor is going to share with us in terms of the future of South Africa from an economic and um, policy point of view and um, structuring and helping things happen business wise for us. So looking forward to hearing his words. Just a little bit of housekeeping first, if I may. Uh, most of you are probably at home. So if the fire alarm goes off, it's your problem, not ours generally. Hope you know where to find the front door. And the facilities, I'm sure you know where those are too. So for the rest of us, um, if you can, please use the Q&A function. We would love to see your questions. Please start the questions coming in at any time that you wish or have them to mind. Uh, Peter will pick them up in amongst his own questions and in conversation with the governor until most of the hour is complete. And then I will pick up close at the end with maybe a question or two that you may not have asked that I would like to get some answers from as well, which I think would be of value to myself, but equally to yourselves as members and guests of us today. So thanks very much all of us for joining us and to the governor specifically, who is probably as busy as all of us put together to the power of 10. Thank you for taking the time to share with us today and to give us the upbeat story, the realistic story, the facts, as they are in South Africa looking forward. Thank you very much, Governor. I hand over to Peter. Peter is a director of the South African Chamber of Commerce and has a job at Intellidex and keeps us all informed and ensures he gets the facts out of the likes of the governor so that we know what's going on in the world. So Peter, may I please hand over to you and I look forward to enjoying your conversation. Great, thank you very much, uh, Sharon. Uh, a big welcome uh, to the governor um, for, for joining us again at uh, this chamber event, uh, one of our very busy schedule uh, of events going on. Um, we've, uh, as Sharon said, had a, um, a lot going on this week with the MPC meeting, um, but the audience here, you know, a Chamber of Commerce, we have a lot of uh, UK uh, corporates investing in South Africa, uh, a lot of FDI investors. Um, and so with all the governor's experience uh, at the Saab uh, as Director General of uh, National Treasury um, many years ago as well, uh, it's great to, uh, to hear his uh, perspective on, on what is going on. Um, so, Governor, to, uh, to kick off, you've uh, adjusted some of your forecasts yesterday. You've revised up growth uh, to 3.8% for, for this year. The median run growth in 2023 is still uh, sitting around 2.5%. Um, but we've come off a really low base from, uh, from last year from the impact of COVID. Uh, what, what's your forecast telling us about the, uh, the outlook here um, for, uh, for growth, the composition of growth, uh, investment in particular, uh, that you see in the uh, in the few years ahead. Well, firstly, is that um, uh, the shock from the uh, pandemic was uh, significant, and it has come from both the supply side and it has also come from the demand side. And in trying to get a better handle of what the impact of supply side uh, shock is and what the impact of the demand supply shock is, it had been a lot of guesstimates uh, involved. It kept our modeling team busy. And uh, uh, in the end, they ended up with something like half of your body is in the freezer and the other half is in the oven. And on balance, you are okay. And so uh, we went out with the same uh, argument that said that 50% of the shock would be supply, 50% of the shock would be, uh, would be demand. And it was important for us to come to grips with how much of a demand shock this is because monetary policy could, uh, in the main, be more effective responding to a demand shock rather than responding to a, a supply shock. You will need other measures to respond to, uh, to the supply shock. But let's also be clear 
that the South African economy was already in recession when it was hit by the uh, 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 coronavirus. And that uh, even with this um, uh, uh, revised uh, growth outlook, which is higher than what we had at our meeting in January, we still think that it will only be up until 2023 that we will be back to the 2019 levels. And even those that 2019 levels, as I had stated, that the shock found us that we were already in a recession. Uh, it just means that we had so much more work um, uh, 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 to do. Going forward, uh, which is what you were asking, what does this uh, 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 tell us, uh, is that um, we think that monetary policy had done almost everything that uh, had to be done to uh, mitigate uh, uh, against the risks. Uh, it is now, uh, today, interestingly, uh, exactly a year uh, since South Africa imposed uh, uh, its lockdown. And, um, uh, and we believe that the response from the central bank, firstly, it was speedy, and secondly, that it was done to scale, and that those steps that we, we took to respond to the uh, impact of the coronavirus are now uh, feeding themselves into uh, the rest uh, of the economy. It was just striking that from as early as July, the May meeting actually, everybody thought that our growth forecast for last year was uh, uh, optimistic. Well, even that optimistic growth of ours turned out to have been pessimistic because it got we got surprised uh, 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 on the upside. So the environment now is a uh, is a good one, at least from the macro uh, settings. Fiscal policy had come uh, to the party. Fiscal risk is still uh, about, uh, um, but the crucial thing for South Africa is those structural reforms. As I had said, you have had both a demand and a supply shock. And the response to the supply shock is to actually not to slow down on the reform process, but to set that reform process uh, going uh, uh, forth to alleviate the electricity constraint and, and the loss so that you actually set the economy on a more sustained growth path. So let me leave it there, Peter. Yesterday in the NPC statement, you sort of characterized upside risk to growth from sort of offshore effects or international demand, uh, downside risk from domestic uh, factors. There. I don't know if you could delve in first to some of those downside risks. I mean, we have a third wave coming. You guys have been highlighting that since the November meeting, um, maybe more than the market was thinking at the time. Uh, some, some thoughts on that from you, maybe, and, and also how that's offset uh, by reforms. I mean, your growth forecast, one maybe worries um, you know, uh, beds up against the uh, the electricity supply constraint in particular. Uh, that's one of those key reforms. Do, do you see that electricity supply uh, constraint being being eased at all? How, how should we think about that? It's a key topic uh, for many of our, our corporate uh, members. We had a, a webinar on Wednesday as well, looking at, uh, at REAP round by the renewable energy round. How, how do you balance those, those risks of reform versus, say, vaccine waves on, onshore? Thanks. Well, um... Just to make sure, Peter, so that you know we are not just a committee of worries. Uh, we also do see uh, uh, the, uh, the positives. If there are surprises to the growth outlook, they are predominantly uh, a foreign. Uh, South Africa has experienced a very positive, strongly positive uh, terms of trade shock. Uh, put simply, that our export prices rose faster than our uh, import prices. You saw that feeding through into GDP, GDP inflation is higher than headline inflation, and that meant that you had a, a higher nominal GDP, and you saw that benefit through uh, the overrun in the tax receipts of the uh, of the treasury, which enabled the treasury uh, to embark on a fiscal uh, consolidation uh, consolidation path. Secondly, is that the stimulus in the U.S. is being done to scale and that the U.S. economy will be very strong. A stronger U.S. economy is good for the, uh, for the global economy. And um, uh, so we actually think that a growth, global growth will be stronger, uh, is stronger than what we thought it would be at the time of the uh, January meeting. So those are all the positive sides and positive surprises to 
uh, 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 to, uh, to growth. On the domestic side, we have highlighted the issue of the energy constraint. And um, this energy constraint for us is actually a fairly interesting one. You know, South Africans do not need to be convinced that we know how to solve uh, 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 this problem. We have proved it before. You know, um, uh, four years ago, um, no, a little bit longer than that, um, 2012-13, um, uh, attending the meetings of the IMF and the World Bank, South Africa was one of the sought out uh, speakers. Why were we sought out? Uh, because we had demonstrated how to run a transparent and very efficient process of bringing independent power producers uh, onto the grid. We don't need any further convincing. We have convinced ourselves. We know it works and we know how to do it and we know how to do it with speed. And if we have to deal with our energy constraint, that's exactly uh, what uh, we have to do. We have announced the um, successful bidders and a further window of uh, a bidding. And quite frankly, for from where I'm sitting, if you have to deal with the energy constraint, you have got to open the generation um, uh, sector uh, much more um, than we had uh, we had done uh, so far, because that will alleviate uh, we will uh, will alleviate that uh, uh, that constraint. Secondly, uh, of course, is um, uh, the other infrastructure other infrastructure uh, areas where we are not yet seeing more pronounced crisis like you see in uh, uh, with uh, respect to the energy sector, which if we do not get with speed to invest, uh, we are going to uh, experience problems uh, down the line. And again, you know, South Africans, I mean, we, we like talking to ourselves, um, uh, but what we have seen is that the South African investment savings industry had actually come to the party and said that we actually think that infrastructure as an asset class offers very good returns, which basically means that you do not have to compel the savings industry to invest in infrastructure. Government needs to come with the pipeline and says, this is the pipeline uh, that uh, we actually uh, need. And that would alleviate, uh, would alleviate the problems. In our own outlook, as you would know, you will notice that the output gap closes very quickly. The fact that the output gap closes very quickly tells you that the problem South Africa has is not a demand problem. It is a supply problem. And we saw that, that even last year as the economy was coming out of lockdown, it was not that many weeks that uh, we had come out of lockdown before ESCOM announced uh, further um, uh, um, uh, 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 blackouts, not quite blackouts, but um, uh, load shedding, rather. Um, so that tells you that focusing our energy on sorting the supply constraints in this economy is what we actually need uh, to get this uh, uh, economy uh, uh, going. There is, I think, sufficient stimulus in the uh, system that demand would actually uh, be taking off. And the problem is that there needs to be the certainty that the supply constraints are being sorted out. There's some really great points on infrastructure that I'm going to want to come back to in, in one second. But just back on the sort of uh, phases of coronavirus waves, we've seen a very slow rollout uh, of the vaccination process so far. This third wave risk, maybe fourth wave risk, even at the end of the year, we can't cover vulnerable groups by then. How, how is the, the Saab seeing those waves uh, in the short term uh, and the risks to growth, we obviously saw some slightly lighter lockdowns uh, in uh, in December, January, uh, and linked to that, you know, uh, fiscal policy is going to be tightening. Uh, is is that really appropriate, uh, or what's the balance between fiscal and monetary policy? Uh, you know, if we are seeing future waves, and, and fiscal policy is is quite con constrained. Okay, um, in terms of uh, the the waves, we do not have the timing uh, right. I in, in this era, uh, Peter, I don't know why I studied economics. I should have studied epidemiology uh, because those people seem to be knowing more about where we are these days. And it's like, if you want to know where economies are going, you should not be asking economists in this 
era, you should be asking the scientists of all sorts of uh, 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 makes and shapes. Um, but what is in no doubt is that there will be a, a, a third wave. And the only question is when that third wave uh, actually uh, uh, kicks in. Um, uh, I'm aware that uh, the advisory council is uh, had, um, uh, advised the National Coronavirus uh, uh, Command Council and that there would be a meeting next week to uh, make the calls. And I think that that might just help us. That could mean that we take steps um, ahead of uh, the wave and that could mitigate uh, uh, the impact of the wave. What is in no doubt is that South Africa had become wiser with each one of the, uh, of the waves. Whilst the second wave was more infectious than uh, the first wave, it did, not, it did not require as stringent a lockdown as the first wave. And we were actually able to flatten the curve in the second wave quicker than uh, we thought we would and were able to, um, uh, to relax uh, the, uh, the restrictions. Uh, I think that where you are in Europe, you are probably in the third wave um, uh, already, or if you had ever come out of the second wave in the uh, in the first place. Uh, but we have become smarter uh, with uh, uh, with this. And what is in no doubt is that is the non-pharmaceutical interventions uh, that are uh, important uh, in managing uh, in managing this uh, 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 these waves. So. Um, uh, we have not been able to say this is when we expect the wave. What we simply did was to present an alternative scenario and say that uh, if the wave sets in, uh, through which channels do we expect it to uh, impact uh, uh, on, the, uh, on the economy? The big defense, though, is still going to be the rollout of the uh, the vaccine, and I know people say that it was slow. I don't know. Yes, slow because other people have done it uh, faster, but it is roughly in line with what the Minister of Health uh, had actually announced. So if you characterize it as being slow, I think that it would be that when it is slow in the sense that by the time the third wave comes, we would not have reached community uh, immunity. And that is the, uh, uh, the big issue. But you know, uh, you are where you are in the uh, uh, city of London. I'm sure you know the vaccine wars that are actually uh, taking place. And as emerging market economies, we just caught in the middle of this uh, uh, vaccine wars. And what needs to be clear, though, as a global community, is that you think you are holding the vaccines for your own population. None of us is, will be safe unless all of us are safe. And that this shock of the coronavirus had actually impacted on global uh, uh, value chains and global supply chains, and that it, it insists in the interest of the global community to make sure that the vaccine is generally uh, available uh, so that we could actually arrest uh, the impact of the, uh, the coronavirus. There's some interesting points there, certainly on the, on vaccine nationalism. We'll see how that plays out uh, and South Africa's ability to get its hands on, on more vaccine. But turning back to that infrastructure point you, you were mentioning on, on the growth outlook, um, yeah, we've seen uh, some proposed changes to Regulation 28 uh, to encourage funds to invest more in, in infrastructure. Um, but, you know, sort of a lot of certainty problems, it seems, around, you said, pipeline uh, of, of infrastructure investment. What, what more can, can be done, really? And, and what can the Saab do? We've seen foreign central banks talking a lot more about uh, the energy uh, transition, um, green recovery supporting um, climate uh, action. Uh, is there more the Saab can be doing uh, to support infrastructure, and in particular, uh, the just energy transition in, in South Africa? No, look, um, we do not pick sectors. And I think that what we have done generally for this economy had been a uh, very positive. But even the amendments to Regulation 28 are not in the purview of the, uh, of the South African Reserve Bank. But it, in a way, I, I will, can't call it a red hearing. The truth of the matter was that Regulation 28 was not a constraint. Uh, the, um, uh, many of the funds 
were way within their uh, limits of uh, Regulation 28. It's just that that amendment will just provide that certainty that um, funds will not hit their limits uh, uh, anytime as soon that it is uh, uh, actually open. In terms of the, the just transition of uh, the economy for the central banks is actually a uh, very, a very delicate uh, balancing act. We participate in two for, uh, global forums. One is uh, the uh, task force on uh, 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 climate disclosures, uh, which um, uh, for us is important that uh, we understand the carbon footprint of uh, the entities that uh, we regulate, that they are alive to the climate risks uh, associated with uh, uh, climate change, and that they have put in uh, risk mitigation measures uh, in place. That is the uh, that is the one. The second forum that we are participating uh, in, which uh, we uh, has just welcomed the Federal Reserve into the system, is the network for the greening of the financial system. It's a conversation of central bankers where we exchange ideas and thinking through setting parameters uh, that would um, enable us to facilitate that transition to um, a, a greener uh, a economies within the context of, uh, uh, of our mandate. It's, uh, that is a delicate balancing act because um, some uh, players argue that central banks must stop uh, accepting this or that paper or this and that and that. And we do not think that those kinds of decisions are in the purview uh, of the, uh, the, uh, the central banks. But uh, we are participating in those fora with our uh, colleagues to make sure that there is a just transition to the green economy. There's some very interesting points there. Certainly, South Africa being watched more than most countries, given the uh, carbon intensity or geographic concentration in Mpumalanga. So some, some very interesting um, points to watch out for there. And in terms of, uh, you know, the banking sector saying to that now, how that's helping uh, the recovery. Um, you know, the Saab uh, last year eased um, uh, prudential requirements uh, temporarily for the, uh, for the banks and um, was involved in the setting up of the, the loan guarantee scheme. Um, but the banks are coming for an awful lot of criticism, uh, including yesterday from the president, actually, uh, on the amount of support supposedly um, given uh, to the uh, to the economy. I, I was wondering, you know, do you feel the, the banks could be doing more uh, here to support the recovery uh, or could have done more more last year? Um, and, and does the Saab need to be doing more to help the banks uh, providing that support into the recovery? Um. Uh, firstly, let me say that uh, um, uh, governors do not respond to presidents. Um, uh, governors stick in their uh, in their uh, in their lane. Uh, but let me put the following facts for you too, so that you could uh, understand why where we are we are coming from uh, with respect to this. Firstly, is that. Um, the loan guarantee scheme is announced as 200 billion, but the Reserve Bank actually have guarantees of 100 billion, not 200 billion. Secondly, is that um, the banks do not depend on the loan guarantee scheme in order to provide support to their clients, and neither do they depend on the loan guarantee scheme in order to extend credit. Credit has been expanding in this economy faster than the, uh, the, uh, the rate of inflation. Credit has been expanding uh, in real terms uh, in this economy. Thirdly is that banks were already providing relief to their clients long before the loan guarantee scheme was put in place. You could go and say what the banks had been doing for landlords in shopping centers, in office blocks and so forth, because the rentals were not, they provided that relief. Those things all have to be uh, taken uh, into account in assessing how well uh, the banks uh, uh, have done uh, in this respect. And actually, 
When I look uh, across the world, South African banks have continued to be pumping credit. And, um, but there is an important statistic to also take cognizance of. In April last year, a lot of corporates raised a debt from the banks. It was a preemptive uh, measure. They raised that so that it is, they are mitigating their liquidity risks. But what was the point of having those facilities in place if the economy was under lockdown? Because you can't use them. So now, I, I like this because you like going to Cape Town. So that little wine estate that you like going to in Cape Town with a little boutique hotel and a little restaurant. If that estate got a credit facility from their bank to continue operating. But there was a lockdown, you couldn't go and stay at the hotel. And uh, initially you couldn't even eat at the restaurant. But once you could eat at the restaurant, you couldn't drink the wine, you couldn't do the wine tasting. Why would that estate draw on the facility? Why would they? So when we assess the utilization of the facility, we also have got to ask ourselves whether we had dealt with the demand side. And for as long as there was uncertainty about what is going to be happening with the evolution of the virus, and thus what is going to be happening to any future lockdowns or restrictions, the demand for the, from this facility was going to be constrained. And so we must also be clear that the facility does not say that there is a stash of money in the reserve bank vault that uh, the banks must come and fetch and lend to uh, uh, their clients. No, the banks generate, the, it's their existing clients that they think that given the current environment, they might be constrained and thus they would like to tap into a guarantee. The banks still take the first loss of uh, 6% before uh, you get to the thing. So these things must be uh, taken in uh, that perspective. Lastly, an international comparison. Um, this, uh, there, there will be new figures from the IMF fiscal monitor, but as of uh, the 31st of July last year, the IMF fiscal monitor showed that similar schemes in Germany were only like 3% drawn. And the highest was Spain, and I think that they were in their 20s uh, in terms of percentages. But the schemes were uh, low, and everywhere else now in the world, people are now talking about the unwinding uh, of the schemes. I think that in the UK, it might have been higher, but that was after the scheme got tweaked, I don't remember, three, four, five times, uh, to try and get the scheme uh, uh, the scheme going. So by international comparison, with 18 and a half billion rands drawn, depending on whether you say it is the 100 billion or the 200 billion, you could say that the utilization of the facilities at 18% or at 9%. In international context, it is not a bad performance at all. I think your comments certainly on going to Cape Town to some wineries will, will chime with many people in the UK wanting to come back to South Africa um, on, and get the tourism industry going again. But the demand, the demand point there, I think, is is very important, and that the two hundred billion never sort of existed as a you know a pot somewhere squirreled away uh, in Treasury or or, or Saab. Um, but this kind of debate uh, brings us back to the issue of, of independence of the Saab, and we had some questions coming in on this as well, that debate, and this is always coming up from, from particularly corporate investors as well, who've seen the independence of the Saab as exceptionally important um, for, for investing in South Africa. That, that debate on independence seems to have died off. Has it died off uh, permanently, or is it, is it just uh, taking a snooze for a while? Where, where, where do you see that debate going and, and, and at the moment? Look, um, I do not see the debate at the moment quite frankly, uh, in uh, uh, South Africa. I think the debate is in Europe, uh, actually. Um, I, and I can tell you, not this president, not any of his predecessors 
not this minister of finance, not any of his predecessors had ever said to the South African Reserve Bank, we think you must do this, you must do that, you must do that. They leave us to act within our mandate. And I think that they are doing that not just because they are decent human beings, which, which they are decent human beings, but because South Africa is a constitutional democracy. And our constitution spells out the role of different institutions, including the South African Reserve Bank, from where we are as South African Reserve Bank. We think we have made our point. We have said everything that ought to be said on this subject, and we have stepped away from the debate. And maybe it's because we are no longer saying anything about it that uh, the noise had quietened down. And if keeping quiet helps the noise to quieten down, then I would rather be quiet about any further discussions on the independence of the Reserve Bank. No, fair, fair enough. There's always a question that, that comes up a lot from FDI investors, so an important one still to, to raise. Uh, another related frequent question is on the, on the ratings, um, uh, which, you know, watched an encapsulation for sort of corporate investors as, uh, you know, a snapshot of what is going on in the country. How, how do you see the, uh, the outlook from here? We're, we're still sitting just below the sort of junk investment grade boundary. Uh, I suppose it, it, it ties into some, some views as well on the, the credibility of stabilizing debt to GDP that uh, you say uh, you see here, uh, based on what the Treasury laid out in the, in the budget a, a few, uh, a month or so ago now. And in particular, obviously, we've had student protests, uh, calls for more spending on that front, uh, maybe some additional SOE bailouts, the public sector wage bill, all of this coming into the rating uh, and some of the rating risk. Uh, how do you think, see things playing out uh, on the ratings front? You know, um, I, I like putting it this way. Uh, if you are a farmer um, and you worry about the weather, don't go and fight the weather forecaster for telling you that drought is coming what you have to do is to prepare yourself for a drought. And if the weather forecaster tells you the rain is coming, you focus on preparing yourself for the rain. The South African credit rating is within the hands and the control of South Africans, not within the control of the rating agencies. The rating agencies pronounce on your credit worthiness. And so as such, we know what the credit concerns have been raised. And I do not think that there is a disagreement that those are indeed genuine credit concerns. We just have to deal with those concerns and we can restore our credit. And Peter, you said uh, we are just below junk. I suppose you wanted to say we are below investment grade uh, because uh, below junk means you are in default. Uh, <laughs> So, so, so and I'm saying that uh, we should be co co cognizant of, uh, of that, that the credit rating of this country is within the control of the South African authorities. It's what we do to restore our credit worthiness that would lead to a better credit rating. And, and how do you think that process is going? Well, uh, I, th I think that um, different rating agencies have different methodologies. They have got different categories. And across the rating agencies, in spite of what we had seen with South African institutions being uh, weakened or gutted, across the rating agencies, one of the things that comes out strongly for South Africa is institutional strength. And one of the key institutions, of course, had been the South African uh, Reserve Bank and the posture uh, that we had, uh, uh, we had taken. And you could go on and then say that at the moment there is a process to repair the other institutions that had been uh, damaged. And I think that the government is doing uh, very well. I think that the most recent budget had started a path of what one would characterize as a growth-friendly fiscal uh, consolidation uh, with all the risks along the uh, path with uh, 
uh, implementation. And I think that the, um, uh, the ladies and the gentlemen of the National Treasury are not having an easy task and they are striking very important balances under very trying um, uh, uh, circumstances. Um, we still need a lot more to be done on the structural reform side so that we could uh, remove those bottlenecks to get the growth uh, uh, going. And I think that that is in totality what you would need uh, to be able to restore our credit uh, worthiness uh, to what uh, had been seen as investment uh, grade credit worthiness. Indeed, and a lot of action needing to come up quite quickly in the in the next little year or so of uh, of the fiscal consolidation, which uh, I imagine everyone is watching very closely, particularly through to the medium term budget uh, in October. Uh, a reminder to everyone to please uh, put some Q and A uh, in the uh, in the function below at the bottom of your screen. Had some questions coming through. Some people also sending me some questions on the side to run one of those, which has come up quite a bit, has been on um, the uh, on the institutional point on on CADA deployment from the ANC on corruption, dealing with corruption um, by the by the NPA. Um, it, it feels like there has been a, a definite move, but a slow pace on, on that front. I think a lot of investors watch that as a, as a, as a sort of uh, key or a, in relation to, to sentiment. Uh, I mean, how, how do you see that and what juncture are we at on that and how that links in maybe with your growth forecast, with the unlocking of domestic investment, of, of, of a recovery of domestic investment sentiments as well, particularly um, from, uh, from sweeping up the, uh, the leftovers from uh, state capture? Well, um, I'm not sure exactly what the question is here, uh, Peter. The, the, the question is, is there an upside to sentiment to come uh, when we, we see further action from the NPA, say, after the Zondo Commission finishes um, of, of dealing with the leftovers of state capture? You know, um, uh, I, I, I like leaving those processes to run themselves. There's one thing that strikes me, and I, I, I will just, uh, and one thing that strikes me is, well, uh, the president and cabinet are doing nothing about prosecuting uh, corruption and what uh, had been the remnants of uh, stage capture. And it just baffles me. The day the president makes an announcement to say that uh, so-and-so has done wrong and I'm going to put them in jail, you must get worried because that means that there is no rule of law. I think that the prosecuting authorities must be left alone to act independently in terms of the constitution to prosecute the cases that they are able to prosecute. That this is a country based on the rule of law and the law must take uh, its course. And yes, people might be impatient because uh, like we say in South Africa, we want to see people in orange overall, but the wheels of justice grind uh, slowly, the process just keeps on uh, uh, going on and on. And, um, you know, I had this thing, I mean, there is a corporate, a corporate uh, case uh, in South Africa, uh, probably one of the biggest fraud cases that we have seen in South African corporate history. And one of the things is, why are the prosecuting authorities not moving? Look, uh, the prosecuting authorities in Europe have moved faster on these things. And when we looked back, it turns out that the prosecuting authorities in Europe had started two or three years before South Africans were even aware uh, of these things. So these things uh, uh, do take time. And I think that just as central banks are left to execute monetary policy, the prosecuting authorities must be left to administer justice. Fair enough. Um, move, moving on to more of the questions. Um, there have been quite a few questions about the sort of micro breakdown of the, uh, the recovery. Um, we've obviously seen quite a differential impact of different sectors, construction doing particularly badly, agriculture doing a lot better last year. Um, maybe some thoughts from you on, uh, on the, the detail of the recovery, um, but also a link question that's come up a few times uh, is related to a sort of widening of inequality or the social impacts of the recovery. Uh, as you said at the start, we've seen a relatively strong bounce back 
uh, in growth, but uh, in headline growth uh, and from commodity prices, things like that as well, helping, but not maybe in employment and, and maybe some thoughts from you on uh, on the structure and, and maybe the impact on inequality from the, uh, from the recovery as well. Um, yeah, well, as I would, maybe I must just conclude on the one that you said, you have, because you have talked about sentiment to say that, by the way, restoring confidence and getting positive sentiment is the cheapest form of stimulus. It costs you nothing. Uh, all that it, it involves is taking the right decisions and you have changed, uh, you have changed sentiment. In terms of um, how we see uh, with growth, I think that across the world is uh, generally accepted that the impact of the coronavirus shock had impacted disproportionately on different income groups uh, uh, in society. And uh, we, have, we have seen that it has also impacted on sectors uh, uh, differently. For South Africa, the hospitality and tourism sector is a very important sector. It absorbs a lot of low-skilled uh, uh, workers. And the fact that that sector can't keep going, get going uh, at this stage, says that there is a disproportionate impact on those with, uh, uh, with, low, uh, with low skills. Looking at this webinar, here we are, all of the participants here, we are working. But if you are in one of those uh, sectors impacted directly through lockdowns and so forth, you are not at work. So income distribution will then even be more skewed because those of us who are able to work remotely and adapt to the new environment, we continue to earn uh, income and those who can't are not going to be earning uh, income. And for a country like South Africa, where actually the biggest source of inequality is not just people who earn more compared to people who earn less. It's actually more about people who are earning and those with zero uh, uh, earnings. And thus, dealing with inequality in the South African context necessarily means that you have got to be having the reforms that enable as many people as possible to depend for their own livelihood through ordinary participation in economic uh, activity. That is what uh, we need to be uh, engaged with. And with that, let's get clear, and governments uh, uh, and the people who lead governments all mean well, and they, they, they can see this challenge that we need to create employment. And they would say that we are going to create employment. And somebody would say, well, employment is created uh, by businesses. Well, if employment are created by businesses, that means that you must enable businesses to be created, to grow, so that they could create and they could have employment. Now, there are lots of business people here. Members of this chamber are business people. If any one of you wakes up every morning and say that, I am going to open my business because I want to create jobs, talk to me. I'm telling you that you all wake up because you want a return on your capital. And it is because your business is growing that you figure out that you need the resources to get your business growing and decide on the proportions of capital and labor that you would like to bring, uh, to bring in. You don't wake up and say, I am going to create, to create jobs. Thus, South Africa needs to construct a different narrative. And the narrative that we need to be creating, we need to answer the question. Do we want to be a nation of job seekers or do we want to be a nation of job creators? And if you are going to be a nation of job creators, necessarily your policies should be geared to creating businesses, to creating an environment for businesses to grow and thrive so that they can employ more people. 
Do you worry, though, about the rise of populism, potentially, if this doesn't happen? We have a huge stock of unemployment, of course, in the country. And as you said, maybe some problems of inequality coming coming through. Uh, what, what, what's the fallout if, if we see these reforms happen, but maybe too slowly, or maybe they're too capital intensive as opposed to labor intensive? What, what are the risks? Um, two things. Um, uh, I, um, firstly, is that I actually think that whenever South Africans are confronted with a problem, we can solve it. There is one thing we are very good at, which is to talk about the problem. And, um, and uh, we end up with solutions that might be viable. And instead of implementing them, we say, let us talk further about the solutions. If we could just get into the habit of saying there are these solutions or proposed solutions, they might not be perfect. Let us go into experimentation. We are going to implement them and see to what extent they work and to what extent they might need to be tweaked to get them to work better. I think that uh, we would get uh, we would get uh, we would get somewhere. Secondly, is that you said that there is a, a threat of populism, which um, uh, I think that uh, you, uh, for the benefit of the audience, said been that in South Africa, when you talk of populism, people think of it as a left problem. But if you are to think of economic populism, because that's the only thing I can talk about. I can't talk about political populism. Um, maybe one day when I grow up, I might talk about that, but I am a technocrat and I want to talk about the economics uh, of these things. Is that you have got both right-wing and left-wing populism uh, in the economic, uh, uh, in the economic uh, sphere. The problem here is populism promise things, and they can actually connect with the emotions of people. What good men and women need to do is to be able to engage with society so that society understands that there are trade-offs to be made. If there are no trade-offs to be made, we don't need economists. Uh, because in economics, it is all about trade-offs. And one of the tragedies in the South African policy discourse is a lack of appreciation that there are trade-offs to be made. And trade-offs are not just about this sector and that sector. They are not just about within this sector, there are these winners and these losers if we are making uh, changes. But the trade-offs for South Africa are also about intergenerational equity, that we should not allow the excesses of today's generation to put a burden on future generations. And the attitude is almost like, but we have the problem now, and we want to leave a problem for generations uh, that come uh, after, after us. I do not remember who said it, but somebody talking about the impact of climate change had something that goes like this. That this planet that we have is not what we have inherited from our ancestors. It's actually what we have borrowed from our children and our grandchildren. And that if we destroy it, they would have every right one day to come and spit on our graves uh, or something. And that we've got to preserve that. And in a way, when one thinks about the South African policy discourse and the trade-offs that must be made, that the trade-offs should not just be about the winners and losers of today, but rather, what is it that we are living or are costing the generations that come after us? I think a very powerful point then made uh, very well on, on maybe some of the you know, problems of the status quo of uh, policymaking, social compacting, et cetera, is, is very present day focused. Um, and central banks, of course, setting an interest rate discount rate, think about 
the uh, the future and, and those trade offs um, a lot. Um, turning back to the the questions, just as we we come towards the close, there's been a few questions from people uh, on the round. Um, you do now put out a well, an almost forecast in your in your model of your views on the the round. Uh, some people are asking where you see the the round going, which maybe we don't want to exactly uh, say, but uh, your your views on fair value, etc. Uh, and in particular, given this commodities um, rally that we've seen, you're also now looking for a current account surplus for, for longer. Uh, how sustainable is that as well going into the, the future and how that feeds into the round? Um, well, well let's, start, uh, let's start with the rent and say that our assessment of the rent being uh, uh, undervalued, we are considering it as uh, relative to equilibrium. And that equilibrium uh, moves... Uh, uh, all the uh, time, and um, and I know that there are people whose day job it is to try and figure out where this thing is going, uh, because uh, they either profit from uh, from it, but we do, we never know where it is going. All that we are managing is if it is deviating from equilibrium, is it inflationary or disinflationary? Is it positive for growth or is it negative for growth? And what that actually means. That, is, uh, that would be um, uh, our focus with respect to the rent. Back to the current account uh, balance. Um, there are good current account balances and there are bad current account balances. There was a time that South Africa was running a big current account deficit. And it was a very bad current account deficit. Current account balance, uh, in this case, the uh, difference between savings and investment, uh, that in spite of that, what we had established was that South Africa had been experiencing a declining rate of investment as a percentage of GDP, and um, which meant that that current account deficit was a bad current account, uh, better current uh, uh, deficit. We ran a massive current account surplus last year. We still expect a uh, significant current account surplus uh, this year. And we had to ask ourselves, is this a good current account surplus or a bad current account surplus? A good current account surplus would have been driven by uh, positive terms of trade and thus uh, rising export prices and maybe export volumes relative to imports, that's good. And that is what we see with this current account balance. It is positive in that respect. But there are negative aspects to this current account balance. And the negative aspects to this current account balance is that we have seen a decline in investment and we are seeing that in the import composition, the import of capital goods has declined. And that would mean that um, uh, it is not a good current account um, uh, balance. Our view as the central bank going forward is that the surplus will disappear and we will begin to run a modest uh, deficit. And we think in this instance, the deficit would be driven by a recovery uh, in investment. And we are seeing some early signs that uh, investment is recovering. And so if we see a recovery in investment and the current account surplus uh, disappears and we run a current account deficit, it is nothing to lose sleep about because in this case, it will be a good balance that we are seeing because the deterioration will be taking place as a result of increasing investment. There's some interesting points there, definitely, given uh, the signal that it sends people on the, on the surface, the composition, definitely important. But uh, a really fascinating um, discussion, um, particularly on, on some of the details, of the outlook. But I'll give the last question prerogative back to, uh, back to Sharon as we, we come up for our hour. You're, you're on mute, Sharon. <laughs> 
as I got the first word out, I realized my mistake. Uh, Secha, that has been absolutely fantastic. I think you must be the most animated governor in the world who gets us all excited with you about the things that are happening in the country. So thank you so much for the positivity and the frankness of some of the things that you've talked about and shared with us. So thoroughly enjoyed every moment of what we've been through. I put aside a good number of questions, um, but they got stolen by other people. I have got left two, but I'm going to probably only ask one. On the um, interest rate horizon, uh, we're talking about, I think, 3.5% interest rate at the moment that has been left unchanged yesterday. But the, in the announcement, they talked about a potential increase, uh, review, potential upward review, second quarter, fourth quarter. Could you just give us some of the things that would trigger that um, activity occurring and the interest rate going up and what uh, activities would trigger it staying where it is now for longer? Thank you very much, uh, Sharon. Um, let me, uh, as then, open uh, to your response to your question, say, the monetary policy stance in South Africa is hugely accommodative. The interest rate is below the neutral rate. Secondly, on a forward-looking basis, 12 months, 24 months, Interest rates are negative in real terms. That is, the 3.5 is below projected inflation. That is reflective of the accommodative stance that we are having. It can't continue forever because at some stage, uh, the saving pool will say, no, uh, this is favoring borrowers over us, uh, the savers and they will reprice you. And in a way, it is a debate globally, as you saw even in the response in the US, where you saw the bond yields go up. So in spite of the central bank in the US saying that um, interest rates are going to remain the same, and in spite of the central bank saying that we think that inflation will exceed our target, but will come back, uh, within the target, the bond market is saying, you are going to have to compensate me for that. And that feeds into the ripples into the bond market across the globe. And part of this move in the South African bond market was reflective of what you are seeing uh, in the US. Yesterday, we spelled out the risks that uh, could trigger um, a uh, a rise in uh, interest rates. And the risks that we have at the moment is the oil price, the electricity price, and food uh, 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 prices. But those shocks for us, when they happen, we see through them, is whether they feed into other prices going forward. And when they feed into other prices, that is what we call a second round effects and could then trigger a, a policy a, a response. Our own projection model that we use is saying that there could be 25 basis points each in the in, uh, second quarter and one in the fourth quarter of uh, this year. Uh, fortunately, uh, the Monetary Policy Committee does not outsource its responsibility to the model. <laughs> we make our own uh, 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 judgments and we felt that the appropriate stance was to keep rates the same. I enjoyed that last little bit. Thank you very much. I'm pleased you haven't gone into artificial intelligence quite that actively yet. Thank you very much to the Governor of the Reserve Bank, Lasecha Kachanyahu. Uh, thoroughly enjoyed our time together. Peter, I've had comments coming in already saying what a brilliant interviewer you are. You two know each other extremely well and have spent a meeting together already this morning. Thank you very much. That was superbly interviewed. I uh, really enjoyed it. And the Governor has given us some genuine frank insights and has given us an energy second to none after all that excitement. We've had a good number of people um, on, some of them are dropping off now already, and we've had quite a few uh, following us on Facebook as well. So thanks very much to everybody. The recording will be out very shortly so that people can share it and enjoy the governor's energy and facts and figures for the future. Uh, there are many more uh,
events on for the chamber, please look at the website, which is southafricanchamber.co.uk. And please come join us for some of these milestone events that we have coming up in the near future. Governor, once again, thank you very much. I hope we will be honored with your presence again in time to come. Thank you very much, Sharon. Thanks, Peter. Uh, Peter, you know that the uh, most said sentence uh, during webinars is you are muted. <laughs> That's why you stayed off. Exactly. Stayed off mute. <laughs> <laughs> You're an expert. Thank you very much, Governor. <laughs> Great, Great man. Thanks, Peter. Have a good and to the yeah. And to the Governor's team for making this all happen, I'd like to thank you all. And to the South African Chamber team, thank you very much as well. Great. Thank you. Bye. Good day. Thank you.